this is Tim here at InstaCluster. Welcome to another episode of InstaBlink. Today we are joined by InstaCluster Senior Software Engineer, Jordan Brayuka. Jordan, welcome. Thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for coming, mate. So today <laughs> we're, we're, we're here to talk about distributed data technologies and in specific, uh, and specifically we're talking about Apache Cassandra. So, Jordan, you've spent a lot of time in battle with this uh, with this technology. Can you tell me a little bit about why Apache Cassandra has become the go-to distributed database technology? Yep, I think to start with, it's it's quite easy. It's a quite a low learning curve on on Apache Cassandra because you when you start to interface with it um, through things like SQLSH, it looks very similar to a normal SQL database. Um, mm -hmm. So it, you can you can get your hands dirty quite easily. Um, but the main reason people love it is it's it's so scalable. Um, so it has what we call linear scalability with the idea being that um, three nodes will perform three times as well as one node and nine nodes will perform three, no three times as well as three nodes. So um, all these massive web scale companies, when we're talking you know millions to billions of writes per second, they're not having to sink more and more money as they get customers. It's much more of a linear input in terms of the running cost. Mm -hmm. um, it also has really excellent sort of fault tolerance where you can lose a large percentage of those nodes and still work. Yeah. Um, and obviously it's still partition tolerant as well. So even if you do have network issues, um, it can handle that nicely. And of course okay. it's open source and has, has such a massive community behind it. Um, I think version 4.0 is due to drop this year. So um, it, it's been proven, it's been tried. There's not, you know, less and less bugs each release. Yeah, okay. And and so so when you when you talk about um, kind of these these massive advantages like linear scalability, cost efficiencies, how how does that kind of differ from you know technologies of um, you know of yesterday like more more traditional tech like relational databases like you know SQL and those sorts of things? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, traditionally, when you've got your traditional database. Um, when you need to scale, you generally scale up. And by that we mean you put more expensive hardware on, you put more cores, larger machines. Um, obviously there is an upper limit to this though. And the, the larger your hardware, the more it costs. Um, mm. So by running on Cassandra, you can run much more in commodity, smaller instance machines and the cost is significantly reduced. Yeah, okay. And, and in terms of, um, you know, I, I guess one of the big things that we've seen over the last 10 years is a transition from on-premise, you know, legacy technologies that are that you know are, you know, using these kind of relational data models to highly distributed systems that are that are based on cloud. So, how does how does tech like Cassandra help organisations become more uh, cloud friendly in the way they deliver IT? Uh, just it's a significantly easier to perform operations like scale replacements, um, yeah. upgrades, maintenance, all those sorts of things instead of having sort of. Um, single instance databases or active passives with this fault tolerance, you can, you know, slowly upgrade nodes, upgrade node sizes, um, all those sort of operations become a lot more easy because you can have downtime of instances without downtime of clusters. You know, I guess one of the big things that we we talk about in Insta Cluster when we're when we're talking to a customer that's either currently using Cassandra or they're looking to adopt Cassandra because they're reaching the upper limits of uh, what the relational database can give them in terms of scalability. The one thing we, we always draw back to is around the data model, right? And, and that if you don't get the data model right, you're kind of setting yourself up for, for failure down the track when you kind of hit true production scale. So can you talk to me a little bit about the fundamental differences that people need to understand when um, you know, writing to a Cassandra database versus writing to a relational database. Absolutely. So a typical relational database modeling, you design your tables around your objects. So you might be Tim, you have a surname, you have a first name, whatever. We would put all those objects in a single table. Mm -hmm. um, and then when it comes to query time, you basically query from different tables and pull the information how you need together and then return a result. Um, Cassandra is the exact opposite. So you don't design your tables around the real world objects. What you do is you design your tables about how you want to query your data. So if you want to, you know, get Tim's and your address in a query, you would put all of that information in a single table. You wouldn't leave it as two different objects. You'd bring it together and return. So your data model needs to be designed based on your queries, not based on the real world. Sounds like quite a quite a big step change from uh, from how developers are used to. Are used yeah, to exactly. Code, right. It, it's different, but once you do get your head around that, it, it is quite simple. Um, it, it's it's a sort of an idea of Cassandra is it's cheaper to store something twice than to process it twice. So the idea yeah. being, if you do need the same portion of data returned in two different results, if you store it in two ways, 
Sure, you might pay a little bit for another replica of the data, but you're actually saving so much cost in processing power when it comes to the joins. Mm. That that's really offset. Yeah, okay. And, and so, so when, when you're going through that journey, I mean, what's the biggest, it, it seems to me about, it seems like you've kind of got to learn another language, right? Is it, is it a big, um, is it as big a transition to that, say from going from speaking English to, to speaking Spanish, or is it a bit more subtle? And in, in the no, way it's that... significantly more subtle. A lot of the nuances right. are SQL like, so you're still doing your select statements. You know, you've got your where's inserts, that sort of stuff. Um, yes. it's, it's more just in terms of that thought process of I need to get my requests down first and then yep. do my data model. It's once yep. you accept that, it's it's not too bad. Jordan, the the sort of benefits of, of Apache Cassandra, they all sound pretty amazing. But um, we've also seen, you know, a lot of a lot of the other side of the coin where, you know, users of, of Apache Cassandra, uh, you know, have, have gone down a rabbit hole and, and maybe done something, you know, and, and then like introduced a, a Cassandra anti-pattern or have got the data model wrong. Um, are there any kind of things that that you would say you need to look out for or any sort of you know pitfalls around um, Apache Cassandra deployments that you think would be uh, worth highlighting? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've already touched on it, but data model is the biggest one. Yeah. Um, Cassandra databases, you can you can get them wrong and they will work at small scale, but yeah. then you'll scale up to a point and it will it will just fall over. Um, so I think understanding your data model. Um, and understanding your queries as well. So I think if you know if anyone's watching this and they've got you know allow filtering at the end of some production queries, that's a giant red flag. You need to go back and think about that because you're not, you know, you're querying in a SQL way when we want to be querying in a Cassandra way. So taking advantage of that distribution and that partitioning that enables you to scale. Uh, we've seen customers sort of start small scale and their application works quite well, and then all of a sudden at 2 a.m. it falls over because they've basically reached critical mass and their latencies are through the roof. And it usually right. boils down to an, a bad filter or a bad data model. But what are some of the things, you know, that, that say relational data models do really well versus Cassandra? I mean, typically if you were to say, a, you know, Cassandra uh, friendly workload, what, what do they typically look like from your perspective? Um, large, large scale. So we're talking lots and lots of writes per second. We're not talking let's and reads. Um, so if you do have a significantly smaller workload, you might not consider the, the the benefits of Cassandra outweigh the cons because they really come come to fruition at high scale. Yeah, um, data consistency is Cassandra can do high data consistency, but generally, if you're talking um, much more consistent data, people will put it in a relational database. But again, only because it's smaller scale and it's worth the trade off. Lots of IoT applications we find for Cassandra, so those massive sensor data where we're just pumping heaps of information into it at once. So IoT Cassandra has some really good um, things based around what we call compactions, but handles yeah. time series data exceptionally well. Um, yeah. So things like that, we, we really find Cassandra is used for commonly. One thing as well that that I, you know, that I commonly get within, a, um, you know, having conversations to people also looking at Cassandra, you know, open source Cassandra versus other sort of cloud native technologies like, um, like DynamoDB or Cosmo and things like that. And one thing that we find, um, you know, time and time again, is that it's uh, it's multi geo, uh, multi data center availability uh, capabilities are, are kind of second to none. Um, and what that means is that its ability to be able to deliver, you know, always on, um, you know, up uptime of, of the of the the database itself is is kind of um, you know is, is second to none and, and is, is hard to compete against. Is that kind of, is, from your perspective, is, is resiliency a, a big, um, you know, draw card of Cassandra in general? Uh, for this absolutely, absolutely. Scale? I yeah. think there's a, I can't remember the company, but there was someone in the US who basically um, lost an entire data center during a natural disaster. And by that we mean like, it was just sort of gone off mm. the grid. And I think their application had sub second outages because they had a second data center that all the data was replicated to. Like, we yeah. can, through the replication stuff, you can set up your data to be, you know, fault tolerant to any number of things. So entire cities, entire, you know, coastlines lose power, yeah. your application can still persist through, which is awesome. Yeah. And again, you know, we're, when we're, when you're comparing that capability to traditional, you know, relational data, data technologies, you're, you're also then talking about multiple, uh, you know, license costs. So the the old adage of if you want five nines of availability, you need to add five zeros to the to the price tag. Um, yeah, and which is pretty amazing. Like when you when you contrast that to to Cassandra, right? Because we're not we're not dealing in the world of licenses anymore.
No, absolutely. There's no licensing costs on an open source like this. Yeah. So, and you can get um, that availability with significantly reduced costs. So you might need to duplicate or triplicate your, um, your, your system or your cluster to say, you know, three data centers because you do want that availability, but you know, it's going to be triple the cost. It's not going to be times nine. And that's all comes down to the hardware cost of running that cluster. Look, Jordan, mate, I, I really appreciate you uh, coming along to, to join me on this. I think it's been super insightful. Um, and yeah, look forward to getting you back to talk about the next technology on our on our roadmap. No worries. Perfect. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Jordan. And remember, everyone, always be clustering.